With a bunch of new players joining for Shadowlands, I thought it might be useful to talk about one of the very first choices that you'll make when you start playing World of Warcraft, that is the race of your character. We'll start off by discussing why race choice is important and then go through each race in a little more detail as I feel the descriptions on the character creation screen are actually a little vague. In doing so, hopefully I can help make your choice a little easier or at least better informed. As you can see from the title, this is part one of the guide which is going to cover the alliance races and I'll link to part two that will cover the horde races in the description down below. Bear in mind it'll be a few days, maybe a week after this one before I get to publish part two. So the first thing to note is that each race is bound to one of the two factions, the Alliance or the Horde. This may seem extremely obvious, but what might not be so obvious to a brand new player is that you can't actually team up with players from the other faction, like you can in other games such as the Elder Scrolls Online for example. So check which faction your mates are playing before you go ahead and start investing in a character. The only exception to this rule are the Pandaren, who can pick either faction. But aside from aligning yourself with a particular faction, why are races even important in WoW? Well, the answer to that depends on how you intend to play the game. If you're going to be a top tier raider or engage in competitive PvP, and by the way, PvP means player versus player for those who are totally new, then races will actually have a tangible impact on your performance. That's because at that very top level, even less than a 1% difference will actually matter. If you're worried about that and you are truly in that absolute top 1% or, or even 0.1% of players, then to be honest, you probably don't need to be watching this beginner's video. Suffice to say, we won't really be talking about that stuff as one, like I said, it's not for beginners, and two, it changes so regularly that this video would very quickly become outdated. However, race choice doesn't have to be viewed in an ultra competitive light and it's definitely still relevant to the less hardcore player. And there are a ton of reasons for this. For example, you might be a bit of a completionist when you play games and therefore really value the human bonus to faction reputation gains. Or you could be a PvPer who doesn't necessarily want to be rank 1 but still could really benefit from having an additional stun or escape ability. Or perhaps you just like the class fantasy of being a hardy orc or a cunning little gnome. Races are what are going to offer these fun little features that are going to either impact your playstyle or simply your immersion from an RP perspective. So regardless of whether you care about the top tier meta, it really is worth understanding what each race is capable of and the unique flavour they bring to your Warcraft experience. Basically, races aren't just a case of raw numbers in relation to performance. There are actually a lot of reasons to understand what each race can do. So with that in mind, let's take a look at each race, get an understanding of their traits, give some examples of use cases, and hopefully better understand some of the synergies that you might want to consider depending on what you'd like to achieve in game. Now when I say synergies, I don't just mean the synergies between your race and your class choice. These can be important sometimes, especially in that sort of top tier that we talked about before, but more often the synergy is going to relate to the type of content you want to play. And our first race, humans, are actually a really good example of this. Basically, each race has one or more active abilities as well as a few passive abilities. If you wanted to engage heavily in PvP, especially in the arena, then the human active ability makes for a very strong choice for this type of gameplay. Will to Survive allows you to remove all stun effects once every 3 minutes. Now this can really get you out of some very sticky situations, as in PvP a player is often going to stun you when they're just about to line up their most powerful abilities to score a kill. So it has obvious relevance there, you can get out of that stun and you can maybe even stun them in return or just get the hell away and they'll waste that opportunity they had to do all that damage to you and potentially kill you. Of course, if you don't care about PvP, then this is still a useful ability as you still will be stunned in PvE, which is player versus environment, you know, things like dungeons and raids. But I think it's fair to say that it isn't quite so critical. Either way, I hope this example gives you an idea of what I mean when I talk about the synergy between how you want to play and the race you pick. I won't go through every possible synergy in this video, that would literally take forever, this video is long enough as it is. The idea is just to get you thinking about it and then you can go and do some further research for the races that you find most interesting. Another good example of where playstyle meets racial ability is diplomacy, and this human passive increases all reputation gains by 10%. Now like I said in the intro, if you're a bit of a completionist and you plan to do a lot of rep farming, then diplomacy is really nice to have. Even if you're not fussed about all that completionist stuff, then actually there are usually some really useful things locked behind reputation in every WoW expansion, so this trait will basically reduce the grind you have to do a little. 
And finally, you have the human spirit, and this basically gives an additional 2% bonus to all of your secondary stats. Now, this is just a flat increase to your performance in a number of different areas, and this actually makes humans a pretty solid all-rounder. And again, this is why I was saying that race and class choice aren't necessarily the synergy you want to focus on. This is very much a generic passive that's going to apply to any class that you want to play. So is diplomacy, and actually so is will to survive. Basically, you can't go too far wrong with human. Let's move on to our next race, which are the Dwarves. Now, Dwarves have an Explorer trait, which basically gives them a bonus to Archaeology. It allows them to survey faster than other races, and it gives them additional fragments from Archaeology as well. This is basically a convenience feature that just allows you to complete Archaeology projects a little faster, and Archaeology is just a profession in a way. It's not really that impactful, it adds a little bit of extra flavour, but I, I certainly wouldn't go basing your race choice on that. Dwarves also have a natural resistance to frost magic, which results in them taking 1% less damage from frost spells. Now, a lot of races have particular resistances like this. It's basically a minor bonus in some very niche scenarios. So, for example, a dwarf would fare slightly better against a frost mage in PvP, or in a frost-based boss encounter. Switch up the scenario, and another resistance would give a minor advantage for another race. And there's not really much more to it than that, to be honest. Again, it's very minor, it's not something you want to make your race choice based upon. Another passive bonus possessed by Dwarfs is Might of the Mountain, which gives a 2% bonus to critical strikes. Basically, bigger crits will equal a greater overall damage output, and this will be particularly true if you're a class that favours critical strike as a secondary stat. Now, this is going to chop and change as classes aren't static and they're constantly being developed, but I guess if you were going for a crit-heavy class, then this would offer a small advantage. But I really do mean small, as in, for the vast majority of players, it literally won't make a difference. As you're going to see, all the other races have something similar to this, or well, most of them do anyway, and if you were to simulate the damage, then the differences would be really, really minor. What it comes down to, I think, is do you want to spend hours looking at a character that you don't like just for a 0.05% damage increase, or even for a 1% damage increase, because for most players, that's just not going to matter. Now, the big feature for Dwarves is Stoneform. In summary, Stoneform basically allows Dwarves to temporarily turn into Living Stone, neutralizing ailments and reducing damage taken by 10% for 8 seconds. Unlike the passive racials we discussed, this one is actually really impactful. 10% damage reduction could easily be the difference between life and death in lots of different situations, especially if you're a tank, for example. It could just give your healer that tiny little boost they need to keep the team alive. Or it could save your skin in PvP. It also removes poisons, diseases, curses, magic, and bleeds, which further reduces the damage that you're taking and can be really annoying for classes that rely on these effects to do damage in PvP. Oftentimes, these ailments we've just listed will put an effect on you as well that goes beyond just simply doing damage to you. They might slow you, for example, or they might even do something more sinister like kill you outright after a certain number of seconds or minutes. Basically, Stoneform can be a lifesaver in a whole host of different situations, and it's one of the stronger racials, at least in my opinion. Next up, we have the Night Elves, and their signature ability is Shadow Meld. This allows them to slip into the shadows, essentially going into a form of stealth. However, it's not equivalent to the stealth or prowl abilities of rogues and druids. For starters, you can't actually move whilst you're in Shadow Meld. But regardless, this ability has some obvious uses, such as hiding from enemies whilst you go to make a cup of tea, and some less obvious but very powerful uses, such as interrupting an enemy cast. Basically, when you Shadow Meld as a Night Elf, even if it's immediately broken by damage or movement, then your enemy is going to lose you as a target, which means that their cast is going to stop. This makes it really handy in PvP situations. For example, avoiding a polymorph from a mage might actually be the play that wins the game. And there are other uses as well. that You can eat and drink in Shadow Meld, for example, allowing you to regen your health and mana in relative safety. And you can also use it to disengage from combat in PvE situations. Much like the human's will to survive, and actually the dwarf and stone form, there are actually use cases for all classes, and Night Elf could be considered a pretty decent all-rounder for this reason. If you're really into, well, dying, I guess, then another Night Elf passive is Wisp Spirit, which basically allows you to move 75% faster when dead. Now, this used to be a lot more appealing back in the old days when graveyards were often miles away from your body. I guess it's still a time saver now, but it is fairly minor, really, and it only kicks in once you're already dead, so ideally you won't use it too often. Night Elves also have a 1% resistance to nature magic. We covered this when we talked about dwarves, just switch out frost for nature in this case. And then via the quickness passive, they benefit from a 2% chance to dodge melee and ranged attacks, as well as a 2% increase to movement speed. 
Now you'd think this would be a nice bonus for tanks, and it is to an extent, but it's definitely weaker for tanking than what the dwarfs have to offer with stone skin, for example. So if you're really trying to min-max, you wouldn't pick Night Elf for a tank for those reasons. However, you might pick them for another reason. This is because Shadow Meld is arguably one of the best tanking abilities in the game in certain niche scenarios. The main use case for this is when you're trying to beat a Mythic Plus dungeon in time. So for new players, in very basic terms, a Mythic Plus dungeon is the most difficult level of dungeon available in game, and bonuses are available for completing it within a certain time limit. The beauty of Shadow Meld here is it can actually prevent you from dying, and when you die in a Mythic Plus there's a time penalty, and you have to run basically back to where you got to in the dungeon, which can really shave off seconds if not minutes from your run. At the top level that's really important, it could be the difference between winning the MDI and not winning it for example. But obviously note that this isn't really a beginner level situation and it's mostly relevant in a competitive setting so like less than 1% of players. But you know, research it if you're interested, you might be that kind of player. As a little bonus for Night Elf, Druids and Rogues, they actually get an increased 5% movement speed while in Stealth or Prowl, and that's through a passive called Elusiveness. Now of course this is useless to other classes, but as we said before, racials are sometimes just about flavour rather than pure balance. In fact, if you wanted to be really balanced, you'd just scrap racials entirely and every class and race would have the same and they'd be baselined. But that'd be pretty boring in my opinion. And then finally, Night Elves gain a unique benefit that changes between day and night. Again, a bit of RP flavour really. This translates to a 1% haste increase during the night, I believe, yet yeah, during the night, and a 1% crit increase during the day. This basically adds a flat bonus to your output, differing depending on the time of day and how much your class benefits from haste or crit. This is actually the kind of ability that makes you understand why the Night Elves having six racial abilities doesn't necessarily mean they're by default better than humans who only have three. And I say this because this passive is obviously far weaker than the human spirit. So I guess the advice there is look at the summation of what a race offers rather than the individual elements. Next up, let's talk about gnomes. Now, as with dwarves and night elves, the gnomish racial abilities are very much true to the fantasy that surrounds their race. Their big feature ability is escape artist. This allows them to use their small and nimble form to escape immobilization as well as movement speed reduction effects. This is similar to the human ability to escape stuns and is useful in similar situations particularly PvP encounters against classes who are likely to slow or root you in place. Again, it also has similar implications for PvE for the same reasons, and it can definitely keep you from getting one-shotted by certain raid and dungeon mechanics. It is without doubt a strong ability. On the resistance front, gnomes have a 1% resistance to arcane damage. They also gain a 5% increase to maximum resource through the expansive mind passive. So in the case of a gnomish mage, they would have 5% more mana than a mage of a different race. How much of a difference is this going to make? Well, it really depends on the type of content you're going to be playing and your class. Some classes and specs are going to burn through their mana or other resource really quickly, and that extra 5% could actually come in really handy, but other less mana or other resource intensive specialisations are really not going to have that much of a benefit from it. Again, I'm not going to go through every scenario as this video is already lengthy, I just want to make you aware of the potential synergies so that you can go and do some deeper research if you're interested. Another passive that gnomes benefit from is a 15% bonus to engineering skill, which essentially is going to make it a little easier and cheaper to level that profession, but it doesn't really offer anything that other engineers can't get, so it's really just a convenience feature more than anything else. And finally they get a 1% increase to haste, so the same as the night elf night time stat increase. You, you do start to see here why it's difficult and largely pointless to compare races on these flat stat increases, as not only are the performance differences often negligible, sometimes they're literally the same thing. This is why I think it's mostly best to focus on the active abilities offered by each class. And even more importantly, whether you think the race is cool or not. Moving on to the Draenei, which, is that how you pronounce them? Draenei? Yeah, I think it is. That's, I've been playing this game since 2005, I, I'm still questioning that, that's a bit of a worry. But anyway, let's start with their active ability, Gift of the Naru. This ability heals you for 20% of your health over 5 seconds, and it's mostly, in my opinion, use useful for classes that don't have a self-heal. And it may save you behind in some very clutch situations, even if your class does have a lot of healing. I actually think this is quite a weak ability compared to some of the other racial active abilities. For example, you could use the Gnomish Escape Artist or the Human Will to Survive to avoid a hell of a lot more than 20% health damage in PvP. 
And these abilities might also enable other plays that could really change the course of a fight, whereas Gift of the Naru, eh, it's just a heal really. Though it is arguably a better ability for solo play, as it just gives you that extra bit of survivability that applies in all situations, not just whether you're in a stun or a slow for example. Though to be fair, you couldn't use it if you were stunned, and this is where you can really get into the weeds debating it all, so let's move on. The Draenei also receive a small bonus to their main stat, which is going to be strength, agility or intellect depending on the class you choose. And this scales with your character level. Again, it's one of those that you could sim against the other classes if you really did care that much, but again, I wouldn't bother. Focus on the active abilities and what you think is going to be fun to play with. In terms of resistance, they have a 1% resistance to shadow magic, don't need to say any more about that. And finally, they have a 10 point increase to the dual crafting profession. As with the other professions, it just makes leveling a little bit easier and a little bit cheaper, potentially. I have to say, looking at this now, I really don't feel that the Draenei get the best deal when it comes to racials. Gift of the Naru is arguably weaker than a lot of the other racial active abilities, and their passives aren't particularly exciting either. But don't let that stop you playing them. You know, if you like their general look and their lore, then that's a much better reason to play them than anything else anyway. Next up, we have the Worgen. Firstly, they have the Running Wild ability that allows them to drop to all fours and get a movement speed increase that's basically equivalent to being on a mount. So it's a free mount basically, and also from an RP perspective, it allows you to feel more werewolfy, I guess, if that's your thing. They also have a 1% resistance to two schools of magic in their case, Shadow and Nature, so double the extremely minor advantage in very niche situations. Then you have Dark Flight, which increases your speed by 40% for 10 seconds, which is actually an active ability. And that's quite interesting because unlike the races we've covered so far, Worgen actually have more than one active ability. In fact, they have three if you count the final one that we'll get onto. Now, this 40% movement speed increase can be done within combat. So there are a whole range of potential uses, such as avoiding mechanics in dungeons and raids, or gaining an advantage in PvP by being able to reach cover faster and avoid getting hit by a particular spell for example, or you might need a little extra boost to capture the flag in Warsong Gulch. Which all sounds very good, but compared to other racial active abilities, hmm, I can't say it's amazing. They then have the Flayer passive, which gives you plus 15 skill to the skinning profession. So basically, if you're a little bit under level in a particular area, then you're more likely to be able to skin stuff than you would be otherwise. And I'm kind of clutching at straws here, it's not really that impactful. You have Viciousness, which is a 1% increase to critical strike chance. So unlike the Dwarves, where they have more powerful critical strikes, as a Worgen, you're more likely to get a critical strike. Again, you can see how the passives are starting to repeat themselves. This is the Night Elf Daytime passive bonus, for example. Then finally, you have the third Worgen active ability. And I, I say active ability, it technically is because you have to activate it, but it only has an aesthetic impact. This is two forms and it's where a Worgen can shift in and out of human form while not in combat. This is a purely RP thing and you'll always go into Worgen form whilst you're in combat. Now the next race on our list is actually quite unique. And what makes them unique, apart from the fact that they're massive pandas, is that their first passive trait is faction neutral, which allows them to pick either alliance or horde. And this is a choice that's enabled once a Pandaren character finishes the starting zone. I'm not sure what else to say on this one. I guess it's great if you're really into pandas and play in both factions. Maybe Blizzard just didn't feel like developing two new races for the Mr. Pandaria expansion. I don't know. More significantly, as a Pandaren, you get double the stats from the well-fed effect after eating food that provides a stat bonus. So for beginners, well-fed is something that you're going to use a lot in dungeons and raids to boost your most important stats. And the vast, vast majority of guilds will consider it mandatory for all raid members to bring food that provides the well-fed bonus. So getting double the benefit is a pretty nice passive. Do note though that there's a trade-off as Pandarans don't have that flat stat increase passive that we've seen with a lot of the other races. And I think this is just Blizzard trying to make the passives a little bit more interesting, you know, without throwing the balance out to a crazy degree. Because like we said before, the flat passives were getting you know, pretty repetitive. Again though, this isn't going to sim much differently to the other passive effects, so don't worry about it too much, don't overfocus on it. You also get plus 15 skill for the cooking profession, again, saves a little time and gold. You get twice the amount of rested experience as a panda, which is actually pretty handy for casual players who take long breaks between play sessions. Basically the rested effect gives you double experience gains and, and the amount of rested experience you have accumulates whilst you're offline. You just have to make sure that your character is rested before you log out and this happens in cities and inns. Once you're at max level, of course, this trait does become utterly useless. 
Another passive bonus for Pandaren is due to your roly-poly bouncy form, you actually take less damage when you fall. Specifically, you take 50% as much damage as other races. Niche, but you know, it has some uses. And finally, the big active ability for the Pandaren is Quaking Palm. This strikes the target with lightning speed, incapacitating them for four seconds. Now the key word here is incapacitate. This isn't a stun and damage is gonna break it. An example of a similar effect you might have seen if you've played before is the Rogue Sap, which will be broken by damage. This one can be a really powerful racial, but it takes a little practice to get right. For example, you can't just use it on an enemy who's taking damage per second from something like a Warlock's Curse or a Mage's Ignite. Whereas a stun such as, I don't know, the Paladin's Hammer of Justice would allow for this. It'd stun them regardless of whether they were taking ticking damage every second. If you were to use this in Arena, for example, then you'd need to communicate your intention to use this ability with your teammates. And this would make sure that your partner didn't mistakenly damage the target and, and totally waste the effect. Another thing to note here is that Quaking Palm has a short range, so it's going to be a lot more easy to use for a warrior or a monk than, say, a hunter, for example. Because these classes are naturally going to be in melee range, and, and for a ranged class, that's obviously a lot more dangerous to do. So actually, that's an example of a race class synergy and a reason to you know, pick Pandaren for certain classes and not others. Now you may have noticed that as a new player, some classes will be greyed out for you at the character selection screen. These are the unlockable allied races. You can see, for example, in my case, that I don't actually have the Horde allied races as I pretty much only play Alliance, and especially for the last two expansions since allied races actually became a thing. Don't worry though, these classes are all unlockable in game, you don't have to pay extra in the cash shop or anything daft like that, it's all stuff that you can do in game. In fact, they're actually now easier to unlock than they were previously, you simply need to complete certain quest lines in game for each race. If you're playing Alliance, you need to go to the Embassy in Stormwind, and if you're playing Horde, you need to go to the Embassy in Ogrimmar. In terms of the race themselves, let's start with the Void Elves. Now their signature ability is Spatial Rift, where you're able to tear a rift in space and then reactivate this ability to teleport back to that rift. It has a 30 yard range, which is a significant distance to essentially teleport, and it has uses in both PvP, for example baiting players to attack in arena and then teleporting back behind the pillar to hide from them. Don't worry if you have no idea what I mean by pillars and, and everything, it will become apparent when you start playing arena. Or there could be PvE uses, you could use them to dodge a particularly punishing boss mechanic with ease, and that could essentially allow you to output a little more damage before instantly teleporting, rather than having to stop attacking and, and run the distance. So there's lots of use cases for that, it's, it's an okay ability. You then have Chill of the Night, so this is your 1% spell resistance, nothing new here. For Void Elves you have uh, spell resistance to shadow damage. Your next passive is Entropic Embrace, and this gives each ability a chance to empower you with the Essence of the Void. What this does is increases damage and healing by 5% for 12 seconds. It has a 33% chance to activate on any given ability that you cast, and it has a 60 second cooldown. This is basically a flat increase to your damage or healing output that cycles every minute, give or take a few casts. This is due to the fact that it has an extremely high um, proc chance when you cast an ability of 33%. So you'd have to get really unlucky if it was much more than a minute between uses. Again, it's entirely passive, you can't control it, you don't need to activate it, it just has an internal cooldown. Of course, you could go ahead and sim how Entropic Embrace compares to the passive traits from other races. It's not going to be that much of a difference. Uh, it's also something that Blizzard can very easily tweak in the balance. So, yeah, again, it's negligible for the vast majority of players, really. You then have Ethereal Connection, which reduces the cost of void storage and transmogrification by 50%. Now, the latter in particular could be a significant cost saver if you want to get deep into collecting and transmog. So when I say transmog, that's short for transmogrification, and it's something that allows you in-game to change the appearance of the weapons and armor that you have equipped to ha display the appearance of other weapons of armor, weapons and armor that you looted previously. This, this might sound fairly trivial to a new player, but actually Transmog is really, really popular in WoW, pretty much everyone does it, and um, this could be a significant cost saving if you have a character for years. And finally, as a Void Elf, your spell casts are not delayed by taking damage. There's no pushback effect. Basically, getting attacked or casting a spell will push back your cast progress. And this is going to result in an overall longer cast time for that spell. Now, Void Elves don't suffer from this at all. And really, this offers fairly obvious advantages in every game mode. 
your cast times are going to be shorter on average because they never get pushed back which means you're going to need to spend less time standing still or if you spend the same time standing still you should average on average get more casts out essentially doing more damage and of course your chance of being interrupted during any given cast is essentially reduced because you're just not casting for as long there's not as much opportunity for someone to interrupt you needless to say this is a pretty strong passive the next allied race on our list is the light forged drenai who have two active abilities and three passives the first active ability is light judgment this is where you cool down a strike of holy energy dealing damage to enemies within five yards after three seconds it, so it's a little bit of extra damage and the fact that it deals area of effects damage makes it more impactful in situations with multiple enemies but i'd argue that it's not really enough to be game changing and it doesn't really compete with some of the other active abilities that we've already talked about you're also able to summon a Forge of Light, which is going to allow you to use your blacksmith in profession anywhere in the world, whereas ordinarily you'd need to go and find a forge. Alongside this, your blacksmithing skill is also increased by 10 points. Now, this is convenient, at least on paper, but it's really not massive. Usually, if you're focusing on a profession, you're going to be in a city anyway for access to your bank and the auction house. And with flying enabled, it takes all of 10 seconds to move between these locations in a city like Stormwind or Ogrimmar. Of course, there are items in game that allow you to access the auction house and the bank away from cities, but you're likely not going to have them as a beginner anyway. Also, there's the fact that if your class doesn't benefit from blacksmithing, then this is a, a totally redundant uh, active ability. So I think it's one of the weaker ones as well. In terms of passives, as a light forge, you gain 20% extra experience when killing demons. Now again, this is pretty niche, doesn't really have a massive impact in my opinion. Yet you could deploy some fast leveling strategies in zones that have a lot of demons in. So the whole of the Legion expansion comes to mind, as well as the Burning Crusade. But, you know, how many people are really going to want to have to go out of their way to do that? Especially if you're leveling your first character. I don't know, feels very niche again. And of course, once you're max level, this passive goes away. Then you have Light's Reckoning, which is where on death you basically explode into a Holy Nova, dealing holy damage to enemies within 8 yards and also healing allies within the same range. It's a little like the Night Elf Wisp form in the sense that it kicks in at the point that you've essentially already failed. Now in a really close fight, it could actually be the difference between life and death for your team. Of course, you're already dead. But again, it's hard to get too excited about a racial that only activates once you're already dead. And of course, you have your good old 1% resistance, which you may have guessed in the case of the Light Forged Draenei is holy. You may have noticed from my tone that overall I feel like the Light Forged get a pretty lackluster set of racials. I'm sure someone will be furious at me for saying that, you know, it's just my opinion, I guess. But I feel like their abilities provide pretty minimal impact and their passives border on useless. From an RP perspective, it's kind of cool though, sacrificing yourself in an explosion of holy light to save your allies, you know, there's merit in that. Anyway, let's move on to the Dark Iron Dwarves. Firstly, they have Dungeon Delver, which is a passive that boosts their movement speed while indoors by 4%. It's nice to have, it's not game changing, but you know, you could get out of some tight spots and potentially shave a few seconds off a mythic plus run, you know, especially when dying and having to take that long hike back that we talked about before. It's certainly more impactful than some passives. Then you have Fireblood, which is kind of the Dark Iron alternative to the traditional Dwarven Stone Form that we, again, looked at earlier. As with Stone Form, it removes all poison, disease, magic, curse, and bleed effects. However, rather than the 10% damage reduction you get with Stone Form, your character gains a boost to your primary stat. So strength, agility, or intellect, depending on your class. And the benefit to your primary stat actually stacks up for each effect removed, and it lasts for 8 seconds. So the more harmful ailments you have on your character, the more powerful effect you're going to gain from Fireblood. This actually has the potential to be extremely annoying for other classes in PvP. For example, Warlocks using curses and diseases that a Dark Iron can essentially just shrug off and gain a primary stat boost in return. I say just shrug off, there's a 2 minute cooldown on it so it can only happen every so often. The Dark Irons also have a built-in damage reduction passive that basically reduces damage taken from physical attacks by 1%. In my opinion, this is nicer than the typical 1% resistance to a random school of magic, and you're exposed to physical damage in the game more than you're exposed to one particular school of magic. Again, it's not major, but I feel like it's better than what the other races have in terms of resistances. Their profession-based passive is mass production, and I think it's a little lackluster to be honest. It basically reduces the time needed to craft blacksmithing items by 25%, and increases your skill in blacksmithing by 5 
I guess if you're using blacksmithing to make money on the auction house and spending a lot of time mass producing items then this could be quite a big time saving on that kind of scale. But in general it's really not that much of a problem to wait a little longer for an item to be crafted. Also as with the light forged it only works for one profession which your class might not even benefit from. And it is actually slightly weird that two of the allied races focus on blacksmithing rather than spreading it out among other professions. But there you go. A much cooler ability is Mole Machine, which basically gives you a free hearthstone to Stormwind or Ironforge on a 30 minute cooldown. This is really good as it allows you to set your actual hearthstone somewhere else, you know, such as a zone that you need to visit a lot in the current expansion, or maybe a far off place that has poor transport links. By the way, if you're totally new, a hearthstone is an item that every character gets that basically allows you to set a home location and teleport to it every 30 minutes. Usually players are going to pick a city as their home location, but this ability means that you already have that covered and you're able to set it elsewhere. Okay, two races to go, we're on the home stretch. Let's start off with Kul Tirans. Firstly, they have a passive called Brush It Off, so when a Kul Tiran takes damage they gain a passive 1% boost to their versatility and they regenerate 2% of damage taken over 4 seconds. It's a nice little boost, not dissimilar to the flat primary and secondary passives we've talked about all throughout this video, though this one has a bit more of a defensive focus. Kul Tiran's nautical backgrounds also make them better swimmers, increasing their breath holding capabilities by 50% as well as increasing their swim speed by 10%. Now unless Blizzard start adding a lot more water based content, this isn't going to see a lot of use, but it'll be one of those abilities that you remember when you enter the water with your friends and start swimming ahead of them, unless they're druids of course, but yeah, minimal impact on your overall gameplay. Haymaker on the other hand will have a rather substantial impact, offering a knockback alongside a 3 second stun. As we talked about earlier, an extra stun can be the difference between killing another player or them landing a heal and surviving your burst window. So for new players, your burst window is essentially the point at which you have all of your most powerful abilities ready to use. It's an extra 3 seconds in which your enemy can't respond to the punishment you're about to deliver. Or alternatively, it could be used defensively to save your own life in both PvE and PvP situations. For example, when you see another player is ready to burst you, you can stun them and knock them back and waste 3 seconds of their offensive abilities. Or you might just use it to stun someone and run for your life and the knockback is really going to help in that situation because you're going to get them a little bit further away from you. All things considered, it's a very powerful ability and a really fun one to use. Back on the passive side of things, you have a 5 point increase to every trade skill which I actually think is much better than a skill in one particular profession as it's going to apply to all classes rather than just a select few. And finally, Kul Tirans are one of the classes who get to double up on that sweet, sweet, game-changing 1% resistance. For them, it's frost and nature damage. Okay, last one, the Mechanomes. Firstly, the Mechanomes have a passive called Combat Analysis. This enables them to increase in power as a fight progresses. They gain 50 of their primary stats, that might change, so it's 50 at the moment anyway, but they gain 50 of their primary stat every 5 seconds while in combat, and this can stack up to 8 times. This is really just another flavour of that passive stat increase. The way it's executed is just Blizzard's attempt to make it a bit more interesting than simply adding 1% to your primary stat as we've seen with some of the older classes. Ultimately, it's going to sim fairly close to other races, and it's also going to fluctuate throughout an expansion based on different encounters and how well it scales. As with the other similar stat increase passives, it's really not one to be basing your whole race choice off of unless you're really in that top tier as a raider or a PvPer. Even then, the active abilities are usually going to be the main consideration. Next up we have Emergency Failsafe, which causes you to automatically heal for 15% of your health when you fall below 20% health. Remember this is just one of the Mechanome passives, and it actually heals for almost as much as the Draenei Active Racial Ability, the uh, Gift of the Naru, which provides 20% of your maximum health. Granted, the Draenei ability can be used at a time of your choosing, but I still feel like the Mechanome 15% failsafe heal is going to save your ass on more than one occasion. And then there's the big feature ability for Mechanomes, which is the Hyper Organic Light Originator, bit of a mouthful. This basically summons duplicates of yourself to confuse your foes. Now, it won't really be confusing anyone in PvP as the duplicates are actually fairly obvious, especially for casters. However, they do do a bit of extra damage so it does allow you to keep a bit of extra pressure on. And they also split the enemy's attention in PvE, which could really save your ass in certain scenarios. For example, if you're overwhelmed by a load of enemies, it could give you the vital few seconds you need to reposition and heal or, you know, just get the hell out of there. Then on the professions front, Mechanomes act as a personal set of crafting tools. So for those of you who are totally new players, basically you need certain tools for each profession. For example, blacksmithing needs a hammer. Now these items take up slots in your inventory and this passive basically saves you from having to carry them. So it's really nice for people who don't like clutter. 
And finally, mechanomes have the inbuilt ability to pick locks. Kind of putting rogues out of a job. Sorry, rogues. And that's all of them, at least on the Alliance side of the fence. As I said before, I'll publish my Horde Races video shortly after this one. Give me a week, maybe two weeks, I don't know, I'll try my best. Uh, but I'll link it in the description down below as soon as it's published. Following that, I'll be putting out a guide on class selection, so be sure to subscribe if you'd like to be notified when that comes out. I've also been getting back into doing some streams on YouTube recently, so if anyone wants to come along to that, then please do. Either way, I hope you found the video useful. Have an awesome day, and yeah, see you next time.